Um, hey, everybody. Uh, I'm joined here today with uh, Mark Hooperman. Um, you're the, uh, are you the president or uh, how are you affiliated with national? Um, well, I've been part of it my whole life, but I currently uh, serve as its national president. Okay, I just um, want to make sure I had their title correct. I've been on the board since I was, I think, 18 years old. And I was the first, I was first, did my first uh, stint as president in like 1977, 1978. Wow. And then I've been in and out of the presidency a few times and um, but always involved with it. And then most recently, I think 2014, we had a longtime executive director in Tampa, Florida, who decided to retire and um, just decided I've been doing this my whole life. We were declining in membership. Things weren't going great. So I moved the operation to Youngstown and I became the volunteer executive director, president, editor of the magazine. Chief Cook and Bottle Washer, wow. and, uh, and the rest, they say, is history. We've fortunately uh, been able to build the organization back up really well. Uh, we're doing well, although we had to COVID-19 forced right. us to cancel our 2020 uh, live conference. We're working on a virtual option right now, but we already had 300 people registered on March 1st when we had to cancel it, and so that was very painful. Yeah, I know there were so many things canceled. It was yeah. a tough time. Yep. Uh, but uh, I, I want to uh, talk uh, first about, I believe you said uh, you, you never um, consume meat that you're aware of since you were I've never a baby. I've right? a piece of meat. I've never had a piece of fish. I've never had an egg. I've never had a piece of cheese. Uh, I've never had a, uh, a pizza. Um, in my whole uh, almost 69 years, uh, June 26th. That's amazing. Yeah. And, I, haven't uh, met, I haven't met too many people like me, to tell you the truth. No. And, you, and I'm glad um, we're doing this because I want to show my audience, you know, you're very healthy and um, for almost 69 years old, I'm sure you feel a lot younger than... Um, well, I don't, uh, I don't look, you know, other than a little bit of a receding hairline and a little right. distinguishing gray here and there, I, I, don't, uh, I don't look too much uh, older than I did when I was in college. And my kids tell me I don't act too much different than I did when I was in college. <laughs> right, right. So, but I am, uh, I'm, I'm really blessed with quite a birthright and, um, and I have enjoyed pretty good health. I mean, I don't think, I don't think this lifestyle guarantees you perfect health, but I think it gives you the opportunity to make the most of what you got. And certainly the greatest blessing is that I think to a great degree, you can control your health destiny. And That's I think sure. uh, I am in control of my health destiny. Uh, and I think unlike a lot of people, particularly in this COVID-19 era that we're in, mm -hmm. where I think people are living in fear of uh, contracting the virus and winding okay. up on a ventilator or something like that, I don't, I don't live in that kind of fear. Not that, I, not that I don't think it's real. I don't think it's a hoax or anything like that. I just think that... No, that, I, I know. Uh, immunity, with the pre-existing conditions. Right. I, I immunity, you and is, I are, are, uh, immunity is something that's built, not bought. That's what the NHA has taught since its founding and uh, we know where the keys of health are, where the keys of health are to be found and we know what to do when, they, when you get sick. And um, that's a pretty good, uh, it's a pretty good blessing and a pretty good way to live, not to live in fear or of, of this unknown that some virus is floating around and it's just gonna grab me. Right. I don't live in that kind of fear. Well, personally, I, I kind of think um, that I had it because um, uh, you know, I did go frequent New York um, in February, um, you know, prior to the pandemic start. And um, I remember one day I had a um, fever, but it was gone the next day. I quarantined myself, so uh, sure. you know, I didn't give it to anybody else. But, you know, um, I think the healthier the person is, the more likely they'll have um, less severe symptoms. Sure, I mean, no question about it. And I, I think, you know, uh, from a natural, I come out of it natural hygiene school. I mean, our, our organization, the National Health Association, was originally named and founded as the American Natural Hygiene Society, which was uh, carrying forth the principles of Dr. Herbert Shelton and other health reformers of the 19th uh, century that talked about uh, that health results from healthful living and, and that the way they looked at, at, at uh, chicken pox and measles and mumps and these quote unquote contagious diseases that these are actually natural processes. You're supposed to get these things. Mm -hmm. And you're not supposed to fight the symptoms. You're supposed to you know, work with the symptoms, allow your body to work with the symptoms, and develop your natural immunity. I had chicken pox when I was little. I had mumps when I was little. Yeah. Uh, I had measles when I was little. Uh, I didn't get deathly sick. I recovered from it, and I'm 
These are what I think they call, there's a term for it, I think zymotic or zygotic diseases. That's what you're supposed to get. That's the way it's supposed right. to work. Even the conventional medicine is talking today about this kind of herd immunity that you contract the disease, your body responds to it, develops mm -hmm. antibodies to deal with it, just like it does for all the other toxic things we live in in, in this right. world. And right. then you're, you have your immunity. I, I'm not waiting for a vaccine. I'm waiting yeah. for my body to operate like it always operates. Exactly, exactly. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, what was it, um, about the um, uh, vegan diet when you, uh, when you were born? With, were your parents um, vegan as well? Or well, yeah, it's, kind of an, it's, a, it's actually kind of an interesting story. that When my parents started living this way, they did it the way most people do. Uh, my, father, my late great father used to say, most people don't worry about their health until after they've lost it. Mm -hmm. And that was true for them. They had some significant health crises. My father, who was a boxer and a very athletic kind of guy, was stricken with polio, uh, walking my, my older brother down the street one day and was facing the prospect of not walking again and being on an iron lung and all those kind of crazy things they did in those days. And my mother had, uh, had some thyroid problems and appendix problems and uh, just a lot of issues. My older brother had bronchial asthma. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny how there are some people that will smoke their whole life, will develop lung cancer, We'll have a lung transplant. We'll have all the kind of interventions. Mm -hmm. They'll go back to smoking. Yeah, they just will make the connection. Sense. Same thing with right. a heart attack. They'll go back to doing all their bad habits. On the other hand, there are other people where those circumstances can be an awakening. Mm -hmm. And they're just open and enlightened. And my parents, uh, you know, God bless me, were those kinds of people that were enlightened. And as good fortune would have it, they worked for a guy they both worked for a, a fellow who owned a furniture store uh, mm -hmm. in, in the Youngstown area, Youngstown, Ohio area where I lived. And he was an ardent vegetarian and also was a, you know, he was a reader and studied Dr. Shelton and some of these founders of our movement. And he, he you know, was not a proselytizer, but he was kind of like the way I take it. You know, if, hey, if you're interested, I'll be glad to share information with you. Right. My parents were open, maybe because of their crisis. And so he took them to a lecture that a Dr. Shelton and Dr. Benish were giving in Cleveland, Ohio. And they talked about, you know, that you can, you can control your own health destiny. Uh, you can recover your health if you lose it through, through uh, water fasting, through a, you know, natural, through a vegetarian plant-based diet, through exercise, slant boards, uh, humidifiers, opening your windows, yep. things like that. So they, they uh, kind of instantly became vegetarians. Uh, they bought a juice machine. They started making fruit and veg carrot and celery juice and the like. And, and they did open their windows, got a humidifier for my brother instead of, you know, drug treatments and that kind of stuff to help his breathing. And uh, they both recovered their health. And uh, so then, they're, then I come along a couple of years later, and they're very zealous about this kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So zealous in 1951 that they didn't, they thought it was wrong to give their young child milk, cow's milk. They thought it was wrong to give their, their child uh, vaccinations and shots. Yep. And that was pretty heretical in 1951. Oh, I'm sure it and was. Even, yeah. the, even their loving family members called the health department on them, complained, reported oh, the it society. Yeah. My father threw them out of the house. And, and, uh, but the, the, the negative consequence was that my mother uh, was trying to nurse me, as, as you should do, but she was so nervous and all that that her milk spoiled and I developed a condition called projectile vomiting. Couldn't keep any food down. So this eight pound, five ounce, beautiful little boy, uh, you know, six months later is six pounds, five ounces. Pack of bones and, and just a mess. And they took me to one of our founders, Dr. Benish, who was practicing in Cleveland at that time. And he had the wisdom to say, number one, there's an emotional component to all this, Ruth. You need to get out of this situation. You need to get someone who can hold young Marky that's calm, that, that you know, will calm him. Yeah. Uh, maybe try some raw goat's milk or something gentle around his system while we introduce some, some you know, natural products into him. Long and short of it is that, uh, that I recovered. Um, I didn't get immunized. I didn't have cow's milk. Um, and in, in, in just sort of a... a uh, curious, almost inexplicable phenomenon mm -hmm. 
because I recovered my health, the pristine natural hygiene diet that I was raised on, the Sheltonian diet, was a diet of raw fruits and vegetables, nuts, dates, seeds, unprocessed, uncooked, and that's the way I was raised. Even though my parents weren't even vegan, they were just vegetarians. My father still smoked. My father did, you know, I love her other unusual habits, but they were vegetarian. Yeah. But because I was so sick, I guess, at least, you know, they've kind of looked back on it. And we've talked about it as I grow older. It just seemed like, uh, you know, that line from uh, the original Star Trek where, uh, where Spock's father asked Spock why he married his mother. And he said, at the time, it seemed the logical thing to do. I, I guess for my parents, they had an unabiding faith in this lifestyle. They thought that the ideal diet was as unprocessed, raw fruits and vegetables. Those were live foods. Yeah. And that's where they raised me. And believe it or not, even though my brother didn't eat that way, my parents didn't eat that way, that's the way I was raised. And, and I stayed that way on raw fruits and vegetables till I was 32 and a half years old. Wow. That's so amazing. every day at lunch at school, when I was in school, I had a same, I had a bag of an apple and some cashew butter and an orange and maybe some orange juice that I put in a bottle. Uh, but that's what I had every day. And I had a big salad for lunch and a big salad for dinner. And, um, did, and, did never, you ever I, convince forward, a, and I look forward to it every day. Did you ever convince uh, other kids uh, when you were, um, when you were a kid to eat? This I can't beer? say that I did. I can't no. say that I did. The only thing I would say is that my parents, uh, one of the things that I think made my lifestyle uh, easier is that my parents owned a, uh, owned, op opened a mom and pop health food store in 1958. But mm -hmm. what was unique about their store is that they were the first people in the country, again, they were way ahead of their time, to retail organic fruits and vegetables. And this was a time before there were standards, before there were whole foods, before there were all this stuff. They would identify these, these maverick, uh, ground baking, silent spring inspired growers of true organic gardening. And so when they would buy bushels of oranges and boxes of apples and tree ripened pineapples and tree ripened mangoes and the best cashews and the best raisins and the best dates. So I had the best of best. So when you ask whether I convinced any of my friends, no, I wouldn't say so. But my house was the place to be. People loved coming to our house for our fresh pineapples and our fresh mangoes and the best. Before people ever heard a trail mix, Mark Huberman had, had dried apricots and, and the best filberts you ever saw and cashews and raisins and peanuts and and people and my friends enjoyed that. And, um, and I, guess, I guess the only other observation I'd make about growing up is that, you know, kids can be cruel and, yeah. and being different can be odd and, and tough. But I was always a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. And, and my father used to tell me that, son, people will pick on you if you allow yourself to be picked on. And I didn't, and it never, when people would say, hey, you're eating rabbit food or you're doing something like that, I, okay. It wasn't going to change what I did. Not right. And, um, and I was a pretty, as I say, I was a pretty happy-go-lucky guy. My family was more, way more than just food. We were involved in theater and politics and travel, and we went to the parks, and we led the Father Knows Best life. And so uh, I guess I grew up with what I have to today, as I'm pretty confident in my own skin. Right. I know what I think. I know what I believe. And I don't, I mean, I care what other people think of me, but you know, I'm, it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. And that's kind of the way I grew up. I was pretty, I had lots of friends because I was an outgoing kind of guy and involved right. with life. I played ping pong. I played chess. I played baseball. I did everything that everybody does. Right. I just had my cashews when they had their popcorn. That's the only difference. So what would your advice be to a, a parent who wants to raise uh, their child as a, a vegan? Well, you know, I, I guess the, the advice that I have uh, is that start as early as you can. Yeah. Uh, I was once interviewed by Chef AJ where she was asking, you know, how, how, how come I never got tempted by pizza and, 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 and cookies and cakes and ice I'm cream? Because you never tasted it, right? Right. And that's what I say. I think taste is a learned behavior and, you know, what you've never had, you don't miss. And so that's kind of the way I grew up. And so she said I should write the book, like, don't get started. And I think that's right. what I would say to parents, that if you're fortunate enough to be together in raising a child um, and set those 
so set those tastes early, set those yep. appreciation of life. You know, and I don't think it's just limited to food. I think if you raise a child with an appreciation for animals and a reverence for life, mm -hmm. they're going to carry those values through their life. And, right. if you, and if you grow up, if you raise them, you know, with, with a, a liberal orientation towards politics, I think the chances are they're going to lead a progressive life. Um, so I think that certainly applies to food. Um, yeah. from, again, I'm, maybe I am a very unique exhibit A for something because I haven't met too many people like me. But no. I do think the principle is the principle is right that um, that if you I also attribute by the way to my um, adherence to this lifestyle yeah. uh, two other factors one is that my parents raised me uh, in the American Natural Hygiene Society our organization had annual conferences every year where I would go and meet other kids not exactly like me but certainly being raised. Right. vegan and plant-based and all that and so I, I saw that I wasn't alone in the world with that and I had the yeah, privilege important. of growing up yeah. with people like Joel Furman and Alan Goldhammer and Frank you did that when you were younger I did wow. so you know, that's a good fortune of mine but the other factor that I was going to add that again I think attaches to many more things than just food mm -hmm. is that I had a great family I mean I you know and I, I worked in the court system as a as a magistrate judge for in family court for most of my career and dealt with, you know, broken families and, and the difficulties and challenges that that can right. present. I didn't have that. I had a mom and dad that lived and died and wanted, they lived for my success and the same with my brother. Um, they believed that they, they, they were there every theater performance that I did. They were in a throw center of every performance uh, right. just because that's the kind of lifestyle. So I believe that, when, when I was raised, if I was living in this unusual diet or this diet that was different from everybody else, if my parents told me this was right, I trusted them it was right yep. because right. I knew they loved me. And right. I, had that, I had that father knows best, uh, all in a uh, wonderful family. That's a, it, yeah, that's it's great. again, a great privilege that, that I've grown up with. But just back to your question, I guess, on, about how raising children, I raised children. Mm -hmm. We've had three children uh, that my wife and I have raised. And um, my daughter, Lisa, of my first marriage, um, was raised from day one. So she's been, uh, she's virtually a vegan. Uh, certainly never had a piece of meat or a piece of fish. She does have kind of a sweet tooth. She's an adult. She's 35 years old right now. So, you know, I can't control that. She wasn't raised on raw food. So, right. you know, that threshold, once you cross that threshold, I think you do open yourself up to a lot more temptations than right. I ever did. But on the on the on the larger level, I also believe that that um, that you can't you can't you can't force children to do something. You can certainly set a good example at home. You can certainly limit what you have at home. But if you want to try to punish them, that if they go out to a party at school or it's Valentine's Day at school and everybody's passing out candy along with their valentines, uh, you're going to punish them for that. You're you're only going to you're only going to estrange yourself or your children. There's That's a, true. Yeah. One of my favorite musicals is The Fantastics that I starred in and directed in college and all that. And there's a song that says, never say no. And the, the lyrics go, you know, why did the kids do something like that? They did it because we said no. And I think with children, you've got to allow, allow them to find their own way on lots of things. But you still have to set the right example, the right parameters at home. Right. And certainly yeah, salads were part of what we did at home. And, and and good desserts is what we did at home, but I don't think you can be uh, neurotic about that. Plus, in all humbleness, I mean, I, I was raised on this diet, and I I'm, I avoid salt, oil, and sugar, but I'm not one who believes that if I'm out at a restaurant and, and the lettuce really tastes crappy and there's no dressings and I put a, a couple of drops of olive oil on just to make it taste like something, that I'm going to die tomorrow. Right. I don't think that. Yeah. yeah I don't exactly. live that way. Right. So, uh, but on the other hand, I, you know, I make conscious choices every day, but I think as parents, I think you need to be sober and humble that, you know, the body can take a lot. Caldwell Esselstyn has a great line that I've always liked. And he says, you know, uh, most of us have a warranty period and we can really beat ourselves up for a long time. And, uh, you know, there's certain exceptions and kids are getting sicker, younger and younger and younger, with the denatured foods right. and all right. the things we're doing. But most of us, could get to our 40s and 50s beat ourselves up a lot and the body has an amazing ability to deal with that um 
but then the warranty runs out. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you haven't been taking care of yourself, then you're going to pay a price. So again, I just kind of, as, as a parent in life, I don't proselytize about religion. I don't proselytize about diet. And I don't, I, I don't try to be uh, dogmatic. I set the example. I was married to my wife, Wanda. We've been married. We'll be married 29 years uh, this Sunday, actually, come to think of it. Oh, and, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. and I should think of it. <laughs> it's this yeah. So, but, you know, she, she didn't grow up this way. And, uh, you know, met me when she was, you know, in her 30s, 30s, something like that, 40s, I don't remember. And, um, and you know, I, I just did it by example. I didn't, I didn't have the right to impose my dietary things on her, but I made great salads. I made great things. And she right. came to our conferences. And finally, in 2011, she just kind of came to it on her own. It's a journey for most people, great. not yeah. a destination. Yeah. But she did. And now she's joined me. And that's, you know, I'm... I'm or, uh, or lucky as can be. Yeah, but that's everybody's great. got to come with their own way. Right. And uh, another question I had is: um, Did you avoid? I'm sure you avoided um, diabetes and most of those uh, conditions that the you know, average I, I American been, gets. Uh, I I have uh, again enjoyed. I don't consider myself having perfect health, but I had my first cavity when I was about 60, 58 years old. So <laughs> really. And I, I broke well, a few teeth a few times. You know. I had a ton of cavities when I was I've a kid. Been, you know. My hair isn't all gray yet, you know, and I, I do wear glasses, and, you know, and all that, but I'm, I'm still got pretty good energy. And, and uh, so again, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not one who, there's a guy by the name of T.C. Fry. If you read about the history of the natural hygiene movement, there's kind of this, this uh, kind of evangelical kind of guy that, that thought that this was just, he wrote a book called Program for Perfect Health. And he put an Adonis kind of bodybuilding picture of himself on the cover. And, and I always resented that kind of idea because I don't think this guarantees, this lifestyle guarantees you anything. It just guarantees you to do the best you can with what you got. Mm -hmm. And you make conscious decisions every day to kind of hedge your bets, control your destiny. Right. Um, and that's what I try to do. I don't, I don't, I have reasonable comfort, reasonable confidence to believe that I'm not going to develop diabetes. I have reasonable confidence to believe that I'm not going to develop a brain tumor. Um, but if I do, it's going to be in spite of all the things I've done, not because of all the things I've exactly, done. Exactly. Exactly. Well, um, I uh, forget who said it, but, um, you know, when, when, um, I think we're virtually, um, heart attack proof. Was it, um, Dr. Esselstyn who said it? When he yeah. You know, I think you can be, I mean, I think, I think the, the one, wonderful impressive thing that if you had to string together what Gregor and Furman and Esselstyn and McDougall and all of them say is that 90 95 99 percent of the degenerative diseases of heart disease and diabetes and hypertension and all these things that are afflicting people need not be right. they just need not be these are all lifestyle uh, produced Illnesses. I mean, you can still be exposed to dioxin. You can still be exposed to For sure, yeah. some of these crazy toxins in our environment that are, you know, sometimes a little beyond our control. But the rest, you, you really can. Yeah. I mean, and even exactly. I, I think the most uh, the most impressive development in recent years within the plant based movement that you know I've been watching and been kind of a leader of my whole adult life right. is the whole science of epigenetics. That's saying, I think we all, everybody grows up with that. Well, heart disease is in my family. So okay. I better really yeah. watch out or it's likely. To, or in the worst case scenarios, the Angelina Jolie phenomenon, I have the BRCA gene. So I better prophylactically have a double mastectomy. Uh, as, as, as gruesome as that, uh, whole, as, not gruesome, it's not the word. As, as tragic as that is, yeah. as yeah. emotionally tragic that's got to be. But I think the science of epigenetics is now saying that, yeah, we, we do have these genes. There's no denying that it isn't true, that we don't right. have that, that, you're, that the heart attacks are in your family and diabetes. But we, we can turn those genes on and off through diet and lifestyle. You can turn those genes off. Right. That's an incredibly empowering thing and a relatively recent development in the natural hygiene movement out of which I came out of before all the science was there validating the value of the system. I don't think that was recognized. I think they would simply say that, yes, through a water fast, through a supervised water fast and a strict natural hygiene diet after, that your body has this amazing ability 
to rebuild itself, to re recover itself, um, to detoxify and all that. And that was kind of the limits of, the, of their analysis of it. I mean, empirically, they watched it, it worked. The people that could, that could, that could um, you know, get better from, that their tumors could shrink. Mm -hmm. that their thyroids could shrink, that these, they would watch these things happen through, and they would just attribute it to the body's power. Well, this is another dimension of the body's power that they've recognized through the science of epigenetics. You really can change the expression of your genes. That's phenomenal. That's, right. just, uh, that's just phenomenal and further adds to that, you know, when I said in the beginning, the, the real glory of this lifestyle is that you, 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 you can control your own health destiny. You don't have to worry about the coronavirus or waiting for the vaccine. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and the body heals itself too, which is an amazing thing. It does, you know, I use an analogy that, I, that, that I've often used. I haven't heard too many people other use it, but I use it. Is that people understand that, you know, when you cut your wrist, you put a Band-Aid on it, right? And if you have a few stitches, you put a couple of stitches there, right? Yep. But it's not the stitches that heal. It's not the Band-Aid that heals. It's giving your body the opportunity to heal. Exactly. By creating the ideal conditions for healing. Right. People just don't seem to grasp that the same thing works inside. For, for, for cuts and bruises and, 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 and gut leaks and that that happen inside, again, given the right conditions conducive to recovery, given the right fuel that you put into your body, the same fuel that gives you nutrition is the same fuel that heals you. Again, it's kind of elemental, right. but it's, it's the basic truth. And then yeah. we are, Robert Mendelssohn once said, the late Dr. Robert Mendelssohn wrote a book called Confessions of a, Her a Medical Heretic and a few other books that he wrote. He said, you know, when God made us, he didn't make too many mistakes. He, we were made to work. Yep. We're not made not to work. And, um, so again, yeah, that's the amazing thing about us is that we do work yeah. if given the opportunity. We do get better given conditions to recovery. You know, again, I come out of the, the natural, one of the unique things about the National Health Association is our promotion of, uh, of water fasting and the therapeutic benefits of water fasting. And Alec Burton, one of the deans of our movement who passed away a couple of years ago, had a great term for it. He said, what, do you, what, do you, what is it that you're doing therapeutically when you're in a water fast, he said, you're doing nothing intelligently. And it's a brilliant concept. It is really, you know, you watch an animal in nature when they're sick, they, your dog, your cat, they curl up, they don't eat. They curl up and they rest. Yeah. They're letting their body heal itself yeah. and recover yeah. itself. Right. It just does work because, again, we're a remarkable uh, organism that, you know, we're here yeah. 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 To, to function, not to not to not function right yeah i was thinking of myself even um because I, I reversed my um blood pressure and i think i was uh, pre-diabetic and i did it without meds with the uh and it wasn't it food. wasn't prayer it wasn't meditation it was just That's common right. sense living yeah yeah exactly it really yeah. really can turn your life around there was a book written uh in in, in the, the national health association again the american natural hygiene society Back in 1964, we started publishing books. And the interesting thing is that all these kind of historic books on the natural hygiene movement are available free to members of the National Health Association on our website. Once you become a member and you register, like you did, you know, you go to healthscience.org, you register, once you become a member, and you can download these ebooks. And there was an ebook, we've converted all these classic books because they're old. Right. But the timeless teachings are there. And one of the books was written by a guy who was one of our co founders whose footnote to history is that he was the producer of the old Hopalong Cassidy Western Hollywood series. But he wrote a book called You Don't Have to Be Sick. And it was a great title. Because yeah, it's I love the that what we think. You don't have to be sick. Yep. If you just kind of follow some common sense living, it's not that, it's not that complicated. I think we yeah. all want it to be complicated, but it isn't. I'll have to I check that out. I, I love that title, too. Yeah, you don't have to be sick. There's another interesting book there called uh, The Greatest Health Discovery that is really, for people that think that, that the whole food plant-based health movement began in 2011 when Forks Over Knives came out or maybe 
you know, 10 years earlier when, uh, when uh, John Robbins wrote Diet for a New America, or maybe go back a little further and Diet for a Small Planet was written. Um, but really, the, the true uh, revolution in thinking about health and disease and whole food, what we now call whole food plant-based, was the natural hygiene movement. You know, it's been around for 100 years. And this little book called The, Gre the Greatest Health Discovery traces the history of medical reformers of the 19th century, some even in the late 18th century, Sylvester Graham, Russell Thacker Trawl, uh, John Tilton, and then in the later century, you know, do uh, Dr. Herbert Shelton and that. These guys were way ahead of their time. Dr. Shelton wrote a book. Let me show you a book that I have. I'm yeah. so proud of. I have it on my bookshelf. Right. Called, uh, it's almost like one of the five books of Moses. It's called Human Life, Its Philosophy and Laws, written by Herbert Shelton. And he wrote this book. He wrote many, many books, but this one yeah. was written in 1926. And wow. the preface of the book is some of the most powerful prose about our living that, that you know, Caldwell Esselstyn would be writing today. That, you know, we need a revolution in our thinking about health and disease. That, that, yeah. that solutions are, we got to identify, we don't, we don't want to treat symptoms. We want to remove cause. Exactly. The solutions aren't going to be found in a, in a pill or in a, in a surgeon's knife. It's going to be found in the use of your fork. Herbert Shelton and his peers were writing this in 1926. Right. And that's what the natural, the National Health Association, those are the truths that we've been propounding for, well, all of our 72 years. So I'm pretty proud of that kind of legacy role that we play in the movement. You'll read in, uh, now that you're a member in, in Get Health Science yeah. Magazine, we often put in there timeless teachings. And these were articles written for our conference journals and in our publications in the 50s and 60s. I don't know if, you've, if, if you are familiar with uh, Dr. Uh, Stefan Esser. He's an MD from, uh, from I think uh, I've heard the Jacksonville, name. Florida. If you I don't know much about him, but I've heard the name. Esser Health. Um, he is one of the best. He's an MD, Harvard-educated, Mayo Clinic-educated MD, uh, one of the brightest guys, one of the best presenters you'll ever see in your life. His grandfather, uh, Dr. William Esser, uh, from Lake Worth, Florida, operated a health institute for 50 years in Lake Worth, Florida, where people, again, learned about this way of living. And his grandfather was an organic farmer that had more glorious mango trees than you ever saw in your life. Um, and apples don't fall from trees, fall far from trees. And Stefan is a brilliant physician. But again, these eternal truths have been around for a long time. Yeah, I even realized it when, until you said that. And if you want to know where uh, Alan Goldhammer and yep. Joel Furman and mm -hmm. Frank Sabatino and Stefan Esser came from, they all came from the American Natural Hygiene Society, the National, now the National Health Association. They grew up coming to our conferences. They, Alan Goldhammer before he was in chiropractic college, Joel Furman before he was in medical school. Wow. They, yep. they grew up at our conferences, and it was at our conferences where uh, people, where they first had the opportunity to speak and cut their teeth as public speakers and presenters and, and look where they are now. Look yeah. what they've done. I'm proud to be a member now. I, mean, I really yeah. am. Yeah. I'm proud to have you. I'm in good company. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you yeah. are. It is a really a, a privilege in my life that, um, you know, we all get sick and things happen and you always, you, know, you fall down, you hurt yourself, and you go to the hospital and, and they want to give you a tetanus shot or they want to give you, they want to give you a, a penicillin or something. And it's nice to be able to, for me, to be able to call my friend Joel, my right. friend Frank, my friend Al, hey, should I do this or not? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, again, a privilege in my life that, uh, that these are my peers and contemporaries and friends. Yeah. Speaking with you, it reminded me of a question, not to cause controversy with people out there, but I've never had a flu shot in my life, and I'm just wondering on um, how you, you as well. Nor have I, nor did my mother. My mother passed away in her sleep at 97. And uh, without diabetes and without hearing aids, without anything, and, and she certainly did not, and uh, I would not. And, you know, statistically, I'm, again, I, I try to, I'm a lawyer by trade, so right. if you want to ask me an expertise on the law, I can tell you everything about family law and property law and all those things you want to know. When it comes to medical stuff, I can only share, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the conclusions I reach, yes. my friends I have and respect, right. and the friends I have and respect say that, you know, that first of all, as a matter of basic principle, again, health is built, not bought. You know, you, you get your immunity by building it, not by 
injecting it, and that uh, uh, and that the statistically, from what I've read, that statistically, the flu shots impact is not significant anyway. That's why I've been reading too as well. Right. So why introduce toxins into your body um, when it when when the upside apparently is so very low? I, I'm not. I'm. I probably if there's one concern I have about the pandemic that we find ourselves in right now mm -hmm. is this march to uh, a cure march to a vaccine yeah and which i hear is uh, march right around to the corner yeah. march to have it quickly yeah. before it's tested before it's and, and you know what's testing you know when they we know today that a lot of the medications and drugs that people take they don't express themselves with problems till years later you know i had a, a law partner whose wife had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma when she was a young wife, probably 25 years ago, mm -hmm. and got the conventional treatment of radiation and those kinds of things. 25 years later, she developed leukemia. Wow. And, and they you know, they say that because, again, you know, the yeah. long-term effect of these things, you know, thalidomide, if you remember the thalidomide babies when they gave mothers, you know, pregnant women sleeping, the sleeping aid, it was thalidomide, expressed itself pretty quick, and all these people were born with deformed babies and that kind of stuff. But you know, it takes years, many, many, get kind of, I mentioned earlier, you know, the body is a remarkable temple. It has the ability to protect itself from all these invading germs and viruses and things like that. But at some point it gets taxed, it gets overwhelmed and the warranty runs out and your capacity to, to beat those things runs down. And so, but how long is that gonna take? Yeah, um, exactly. These are toxins that you're, I mean, there's no question about it. And, you know, they, they don't tell you what's in these things. You know, there's, there's formaldehyde, yeah, and, and, mercury, and, and, there's all kinds of things that we wouldn't normally take a sip of. Right. And to me, I'm also an ethical vegan and I, I would worry about, you know, the animal tested, um, you know. Yeah, I am as well, by the way. That's just, a, you know, not, I, I didn't become a, um, I didn't come into this world and was not raised in this world by my parents as an ethical vegan. Uh, I was raised in this world for health reasons. Right. But um, it, it certainly is incredibly consistent. Yeah, there is yeah, one book sure. I remember reading as a kid by a British guy by the name of Jeffrey Rudd called Why Kill for Food. And for me as a young kid, it was just comforting. It talked about you know the brutalizing behavior. I mean, I have many, many friends that hunt and they're nice people and they're not, you know, but I do, I, I, I have to believe that there is a desensitization that goes on about life when mm -hmm. you, can, you can hide in a tree to kill an innocent deer. Uh, again, doesn't mean that, you, that you're going to go out and become an axe murderer, but I think there is a sensitivity about life, and um, I think it's consistent. Unfortunately, growing up like I did, you know, it has turned out that it is better for the planet. It's better for the critters on the planet, uh, and it is. And it is. It, it does. It does provide a much more humane world. You know, I believe that. That I, one of the things that I find pretty compelling is the, the, Dr. Greger just posted a video today on wet markets. And I'll have to check that out. On, yeah. on wet markets, and but you know, Frank Sabatino and others say it's not just wet markets. It's our whole, it's our whole factory farming and slaughterhouses yeah. and this whole yes, thing that are, that are yes. allowing this cross contamination and, and disease cesspools that they're doing. That that again, if you if we, we if we were all raised on a plant based diet, yeah. not only would it solve the greenhouse gas problems of the world, but again, uh, it would be a lot less suffering, right? And um, and the world would be a better place. Mm -hmm. I mean, I and, and uh, just as kind of our own personal evolution, you know, again, I didn't grow up as a a vegan, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't grow up protesting the circuses, and I went to the circuses when I was a kid. I don't go anymore. Right. I, I don't too. go to the yeah. anymore, but I did. Yeah. But yeah. you know, we all gain. We all uh, we can all get wiser and hopefully learn a little more. Yeah, and be it's learned. about learning. So a couple of years ago, I was watching uh, at a conference that we had in Florida. Victoria Moran, who's just an amazing lady, the Main Street Vegan. Uh, and, and authors, and marvelous books, and a longtime member of our association, put together a documentary. I don't know if you've seen it called "A Prayer for Compassion." No, it's, uh, it's just a beautiful film, and it it, it goes it takes people of 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 of, um, 
around the world of all different faiths and mm -hmm. people within those faiths that find compassion and a reason to be vegan within their faith. Right. Jewish, you know, Jewish vegetarians and Christians and Buddhists and all that, and, and great exponents of this lifestyle. And it had, as most of these documentaries do, you know, have those scenes in them of the, the needless slaughter and harm and all that of, of slaughterhouses and factory farms. And they're hard to look at and all this. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. I've been looking at those my whole life, and I certainly never have been part of that. And I just made a decision at, well, I guess I was then 67 years old, that, you know, what am I doing when I'm wearing a leather belt and leather shoes? Yeah, you start thinking these what, things. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, not, that, not that I believe that, not that, and, and, and so I just decided, I went to, a, I, I called Victoria and I said, well, where can I get some, you know, non-leather shoes and things like right. that? She referred me to a place called Moo Shoes in New York, in, in Brooklyn, right. and, uh, or in Manhattan. And I went and I got a pair of shoes and I got a belt and I got a wallet yeah. and, and it just did, and I'm not, I, I, I guess I, I am here a little bit on a soapbox, but I'm not here saying, hey, I'm great, and what's wrong with you? I'm, no, just, saying, yeah. I'm just saying, you know what? It, it's, it's, we can all do a little better, and we can all think a little better. And I, I thought, yeah, when I, after watching the movie, it was just my own little personal evolution, I thought, well, you know, where do I think that wallet came from? Where do I think those shoes came from? My le that leather jacket that I used to wear in the 60s, where did that come from? Did it come from some, just some poor cow just kind of died his life on the side of the road and they picked him up and they just said, well, we, we could do something with this, with this leather. That's not how it happens. Exactly. That's not how it happens. And so my wife is, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're both at retirement age and so we've always leased cars, but we're buying a car. Well, when I'm buying a car, I'm not buying leather anymore. Yeah, that's what I think as well. Why, why do that? I mean, not, and again, I'm not on the soapbox. I'm not going to get down the street and, and protest. Oh, I, I, yeah. I I, down. Exactly. But I think we can all do better, and that's just personal. That's just a personal uh, personal decision I made. Similarly, again, I have nothing to do with health per se, but you know, I'm a, I'm a, a diet-in-the-wool sports fan. I'm, I'm from you know, the Cleveland market, so I'm Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Cavaliers, Cleveland Browns. Uh, when LeBron James brought the championship to Cleveland, this was the greatest day of my life. One of the greatest days of my life. Right. And but you know, our Cleveland Indians mascot was a Yahoo, was Chief Wahoo, a very stereotypical depiction of an Indian. Right. And with the long nose and the beak and all that kind of stuff. And I just decided around that same time, you know, what am I perpetuating here? I'm not picketing the Cleveland Stadium, but no. I just decided, you know, I'm I'm going to use the the Cleveland C. Yeah. on all my paraphernalia that I proudly wear when I go to the games and everywhere else. Right. Just a decision that I just made for myself because I think it's the right thing to do. Right. Uh, it's my little, uh, it's just, just for me. Again, right. when somebody else does something different, I'm not going to sit and judge. Yeah. I, I have an opinion, yeah. but I'm not going to do that. I just people. feel like everybody can do their part. You we know. can all do our part. Yeah. That's well put. Yeah, yeah. I, I wish I had said that. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd, right. I'd like... Um, people to know how to um, get involved with um, with your website, if you could uh, tell people a little bit more sure. about it. Well, the website, speaking of the website, in about 30 days, you're going to see a brand new state-of-the-art uh, website for the NHA. Our current website's 15 years old. We're building a platform called Drupal, which is a little tough to... Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with Drupal. Drupal. So we're having a new one uh, being done that'll be unrolled, uh, unfurled in about 30 days, where members will be able to manage their own membership and gain much easier access to to uh, health science and you know I mentioned that uh, so currently and it'll be the same you go to healthscience.org which is our URL um, and uh, and you it's $35 a year for people uh, in the uh, in the US $55 for people outside the US if you join for two years you save a few bucks I think it's five bucks less if you join for two years um, and when you do you not only gain uh, you not only gain access to health science, which is a real publication, comes out four times a year, but it also gives you access to all 42 years of back issues for nothing. And not only those 42 years, but before health science, there was a publication called Natural Hygiene, and before that one called the Journal of Natural Hygiene, where some of these really classic people that were Shelton and Benish and Esser were writing, and Dr. Bob Gross from New York writing way ahead of their time. They're also available free, these kind of timeless teachings you can do for free, as well as about 14 ebooks 
on the history, the rich history of our health movement. Again, all of it's for free. We're a 501c3. We've been that way for most of our history. So we're here for education, not to make money. Uh, well, I mean, we, you know, we certainly need to survive and pay our bills and pay for our website fees and that, but we don't sell anything but education. Right. And that's kind of what we do. And uh, so it's, I don't think we've raised the price of membership in the NHA in probably 25 years. Oh, that's incredible. Because again, we're trying to get our message out to yeah. as many people as we can. Our 2020 conference that again had 300 people registered in March when we had to cancel it. Uh, we're working on a virtual option for, uh, for probably late August. Yeah, and I plan to uh, sign up for that. Yeah. One of the things that, that you will find in our conferences, it's kind of a who's who of this movement. So uh, on one weekend, when it's live or when it's virtual, I mean, there's Joel Furman, there's Alan Goldhammer, oh, Frank yeah. you know, um, uh, Michael Greger, yep. uh, 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 Michael Clapper, uh, everybody who's everybody. And uh, it's, 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 great. it's a great family. Let's put it that way. Oh, for sure. For sure. I'm looking forward to it, too. I think also, I, I might just add that, uh, I'll show you to your viewers here. This is um, uh, Health Science Magazine. This is the winter issue, the spring issue just came out, but it's, it's unique and it's one of the best magazines that you'll find on the planet because it's 40 pages long right. and it has no advertising in it. I defy you to find a magazine anywhere that does that. You know, most, yeah, of, the, yeah. most of the magazines in the vegetarian vegan world our recipe magazines. I mean, even even uh, Forks Over Knives, which is a great great publication, right. is seventy percent recipes, and they're great recipes. It's an animal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're yeah. great recipes, and they make your mouth water. Um, but ours is more than that. Ours talks about water fasting. It talks about sleep. It talks about health. It talks about, uh, and then there are recipes. But all of the chefs, each each issue has a chef. Yeah. Uh, a recipe person, but they're all people that are kind of the gold standard that are that that prepare all of their meals without added oil, salt, or sugar. And so that's Chef AJ, Kathy Fisher, Katie May. In the upcoming issue, Brittany Giroudi, who's gaining a great following on on social media, the Giroudi family. Um, so you get recipes. There's seven or eight. They're you know kind of by season, and they're all great. And again, when you register on our website, uh, all of those recipes are there. Yeah, I can't, I can't wait to really go through it this weekend. There's a lot to dive into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. There is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I probably have to sign off soon as I have another meeting, but um, I really enjoyed our time. And um, yeah, I'd like to, to meet with again you. soon. So what part, you're in New York? Well, I'm in Connecticut, actually. Oh, Connecticut. So uh, I, have a, I have a dear friend who's a member of the NHA. One of the dearest members is in Norwalk, Connecticut. And I have vowed that I'm going to come visit her one day. And are you anywhere near Norwalk? No, but I work near there. All right. Well, uh, so I'll, back at, I'll be back at um, work uh, probably sometime in July. So. How far from Norwalk? It's like 15 minutes. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. So when I go visit her, I'll go visit the Hubbard. Yeah, definitely. We'll have lunch. Absolutely. Yeah. Or right. I'll bring lunch. <laughs> or, yeah, <laughs> either way. I always have, I always, my, my, my trademark growing up, and I've, I've led a very public life because I always have an avocado. I never tell you, that's my butter. It was always my butter. So there's always an avocado in my pocket. I love that avocado. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't live without it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, nut, but, nut butters are my weakness. Yeah. Well, that's, that butter. was really, uh, if that was a secret to how I grew up, uh, it was cashew butter and almond butter. And I had a champion yeah. juicer and my mother would make her own almond butter. And uh, by the way, for, for people that like cashew butter, uh, this is just a free free tip. There's no better cashew butter in the world than Joel Furman's uh, organic raw cashew, his, his raw cashew butter. Um, it's fabulous. It's just you can buy it from or you, make it? you can buy it at drfurman.com. So I might try that. I, uh, I, I, it's I, the best. I mean, you can make it in the champion juicer and the Vitamix takes a little work, but to just buy it and have it without added oil, just yeah, cashew. I, I, can't find it any, I can't find it in any store without oil. His is, his is the one. It's, it's Bazzini Nut Company. Uh, I think is the source of it, but it's the kind that I grew up with and, and he, it's still the one that I get. And by the way, just one other plug for Dr. Furman, another great item on his website, if you've never had it, is, uh, is his, pine, his Mediterranean pine nuts. 
they're also pricey. Oh, I, you've I never tried had that. pine yeah. nuts until yeah. you've had Dr. Furman's pine nuts. Yeah, I've tried those. Those are excellent. They're unbelievable. They're just pricey, but they're great. Hey, you'll have to check out my uh, interview with Dr. Furman. There's a few of them on my uh, YouTube channel. That's awesome. Uh, I'll when, look you have, to when you have a chance. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. And um, I really enjoyed meeting. the time. You bet. We'll have to meet sometime soon. Definitely. Have a great one. Yep, you too. Bye-bye.